Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, this isn't intimidating at all, standing here. Um, so we'll start with some introductions. Uh, my name is John McCaffrey. I'm Research Services Manager at the University of Dundee. And I'm presenting today with my colleague, Rebecca Coatsmith, who is, what's your job title? Research Impact Manager. And we put together a presentation in conjunction with my, my other colleague, Moya, Moya Fox, who unfortunately wasn't able to join us today. So what we're going to be discussing is um, how we are been looking at impact and pure from a Dundee perspective, a perspective from, from our own particular university. So, starting off with a little bit of context about the University of Dundee, in case you might not be aware of where we are. So, this is Dundee. We are in the uh, eastern coast of Scotland, just north of Edinburgh. And to give you some context, um, where they, we are in relation to the rest of the UK. Uh, in terms of the size of the institution, we are uh, regarded as a kind of medium-sized university in, uh, from a UK perspective. So we have um, just over 16,000 students, uh, 3,280 staff, but we are quite research intensive for our size. Uh, 75 million pounds worth of research grants income per year over the last five years plus 25 million from uh, direct UK government funding. Um, we are, as a reflection of that uh, research intense nature of the university, we have the third highest proportion of research related income of any UK university. And I'm quite proud of that. Um, speaking as a librarian, I'm actually more proud of the fourth point there. Uh, we are fourth in the world for the proportion of our outputs which are available as open access according to Leiden. And we're quite pleased with that. And we're aiming for third next year. As far as Pure is concerned, we got Pure, I think it was about 2012. It was in advance of the, the 2014 REF. That's a delivery mechanism essentially for that. And we've been building upon it uh, ever since. So our uh, I won't go through all this in any detail, but it's really just to illustrate where we get all our content from. So our research outputs are largely sourced from both Scopus and PubMed. We have a very strong life sciences and medical uh, schools, so that's why the emphasis is there on PubMed. Um, and we uh, use that as our, essentially our main source of truth for uh, what where our, our research outputs are coming from. Of course, that's added to by uh, researchers adding things in themselves and for all this stuff that doesn't appear in either of those two sources. Um, research projects, we, we source, ag again, directly, our synchronization directly from our colleagues in our research finance department. Uh, our profiles are, di again, directly synced from our HR and our registry systems. So all that comes in. Student theses are deposited by our research postgraduate students. That has been a condition of the degree for, I think it's about, been about the last five or six years. So it's, it's, it's a, a mandatory. They have to deposit within uh, our um, discovery research portal. Otherwise, they don't get to graduate, which is a tremendous motivation, we find. Then we come to all the fun stuff that gets deposited by researchers, and it's entirely at their whim. So that's activities and prizes and press and media and data sets. We are looking at data monitor at the moment as a way of getting that in. Uh, that's an ongoing issue that's going on there. Um, which brings us then to the question of impacts. So looking at this, um, we, we were considering at Dundee, the impact content type wasn't getting used. Or if it was getting used, it was getting used for the wrong thing. And we thought, is it us? Is it just Dundee but who's got this decision? So we thought we'll do a little bit of investigating. 
And so the methodology, and I apologise right now for, the, for how this methodology is, it is by no means a comprehensive survey of the use of the impact content type across all of Pure in the world. What it is, is something we've done quickly, given I think the call for papers for this conference came out in about July, and we didn't have a whole lot of resource to throw at this. So we used Pure's uh, portal page, the page on Elsevier's website, which lists all the Pure portals, which we visit regularly and steal ideas from. I mean, well, we, we, we look at other practice and then adopt it for our own methods. Um, and so we look to see how many of those portals that are currently available via the, the, the Pure webpage are showing impacts around the world. And this is what we found. Uh, going across the, the, the various areas and dividing the areas up by the way that Elsevier divides the world up into. So Asia Pacific, uh, at that time there were nine countries, 46 institutions, nine of whom were showing impacts. The vast majority of those were in Australia. In the Middle East and Africa, six countries, seven institutions, only one showing an impact. South America, five, 16, and two. Europe, just skipping across there, 17 in countries, 119 institutions, 26 showing impacts, the vast majority being in the UK. North America was the one that really surprised me. Two countries listed, the US and Mexico. 30 institutions, only one showing impacts, and that institution was in Mexico. None, no institution in the United States was were demonstrating or showing impacts. Why? Why is this difference around the world? We all do performance-based reviews of research at Cusar all over the place. It's not unique to the UK. It's not unique. Uh, the REF in the UK or the ERA in, the, in Australia, it's not unique to us. Uh, approaches to the, the uh, assessment of research incomes vary. Terminology also varies. In the UK, one reason why you might see that we've been quite prominent in this is that it comes down to money. As in so much in life, it comes down to money. Impact assessment is, research to, is related to funding. We might say that there's a need for further research here. We, if there was to be further research, I would kind of like else of you to fund it, if they were going to do it. I'm guessing that you guys can't go and look and see who's using the impact content types in the same way, because it's not something that you buy extra like um, uh, awards, or the assessment, uh, the uh, AAM module. It's just something that comes with the territory. But it may be that there is a need for further research to, to uh, be more precise and, and see if it does actually reflect the results that we have come across here in this very short and very um, uh, superficial survey. So at this point, I will hand over to my colleague, Rebecca, who knows far more about impact than I do, and she can talk you through the, the UK context for impact. Hi, everyone. Um, can I just have a quick show of hands how many people in the room are from the UK? Okay, okay. So I, th I thought um, for, the, for the purposes of this audience, it might be useful to give a little bit more detail ab ab about the context for funding and, and how the impact agenda really joins up with that. So I'm sure everyone will have heard the, the acronym REF used ad infinitum um, in the UK. Uh, our funding from research operates on a dual model. We have the government funding for research, and then we have other funding, uh, other funding sources. And government funding comes to us through th two routes, block funding or quality-related funding. And this is block funding directly allocated to institutions by government. And it's allocated based on performance in the cyclical assessment of research, otherwise known as the REF. And this assessment takes place every six to seven years, and impact forms 25% of our weighting for that. 
So it's a strategic imperative for UK universities that we do well in the REF, and in particular that we do well for impact case studies. The other strand of funding for government research comes through competitively awarded funding, and this is managed um, through seven research councils, broadly research, uh, research discipline based, overseen by Research England. And they, um, they run competitive funding awards and applicants are expected to embed impact in their applications and to account for impact through their reporting. And that happens through a range of mechanisms. Other funding sources, um, Horizon Europe, industrial funding, royal and learned societies, professional bodies, etc. When impact was introduced in 2014, it accounted for 20% of that weighting, and that's increased to 25%. And we anticipate now that the impact is going to remain for the foreseeable future, fingers crossed, for some of us in impact-related roles. Um, and what we see in, uh, in the UK research environment is that impact is becoming increasingly established. Not just the, the increase in mechanism, but the way it's reflected in institutions and organisations through uh, human resources, um, such as impact manager roles, impact facilitators, also through systems and processes for the review and evaluation of impact, and through IT systems. We also see a growing body of literature um, around uh, both academic and grey literature around impact and around its evaluation and around the development of impact case studies. And also, of course, that growing body of impact case studies that are accessible through the UK REF system. And there's a link there in the slide. We also, in the structural environment and in the funding environment, see uh, research councils increasingly aligned around the to topic of impact to the extent where they are now starting to time their calls and encourage universities to collaborate on impact acceler accelerator accounts. But the IT systems are really something that we see as underpinning our ability to um, support and evidence our impact case studies. And this is what led us to a review of how we use PURE at Dundee and, and actually what level of information we have. What we found was um, perhaps a little disappointing. The impact template at Dundee is not well used. Um, it's had historically low levels of use, and, the, and we think there are a variety of reasons around this. Impact has not been well staffed at the university, so there is a lot more that we could be doing to integrate impact into professional service roles and into academic-related roles. I'm working on the development of impact-focused resources. So these are static resources that researchers can access, but also online, virtual, and, and physical face-to-face -face training sessions. Because one of the reasons that, that we also believe lies around the, the historically low levels of use are a confusion, a lack of understanding perhaps around what academics are expected to capture and how best to record this. The university has a very strong um, public engagement forum. It's well established. We have a, a, quality, a gold quality award from the NCCPE, which is the National Coordinating Centre for Public Engagement in the UK. And the university is rightly proud of this. Um, but talking to academics, there is a confusion often between uh, the activity of going out and engaging with people and some, some researchers seeing that activity in itself as being impact versus what I often speak to them about, which is the tangible difference that that engagement makes. And what we saw when we actually started to analyse the information on PURE was that a lot of the information that was being captured under impact actually fitted much better under activity. So for us, there is a piece of education to do around what is impact versus not impact, but maybe impact related. 
And then how do we use the templates to capture that? So our approach has been uh, myself working in conjunction with John and Moya to, to try and bring a multi-pronged and collaborative approach, um, bringing together key stakeholders. And when I talk about stakeholders, I, I mean, obviously there's, there's the impact and there's the librarians, but there's IT staff as well. We don't have technical developers for, for Pure, um, so any changes that we make to our impact template have to go through IT. And then there's also the development of guidance document and redesign of the template. So our project so far has broken down more or less into five phases, two of which are complete. You'll see them here. Uh, phase one, Moya and myself spent some time looking at actually identifying what fields could be changed and, and what fields we wanted to change and how, and is this just a change to the description or are we repurposing fields? And what we've done is work together to establish how to do those and, and to, to embed those changes in the template. And we'll come on in a couple of slides to, to um, what those changes look like. Um, phase three, which is in progress at the minute, and I anticipate hopefully being able to update at the, the next user conference or, or through the UK user group, is consultation with researchers and academics, the people who we're encouraging to use the template to see whether the changes that Moya and I make make sense to them or whether we need to revisit phase two. And I'll let John cover four and five and then we'll, we'll show you some screenshots of the template. Yeah, very, very briefly, uh, looking to, to actually provide this service next year. Um, workflows, roles, roles and responsibilities. We are not looking to validate, um, uh, provide a validation service for impacts. We are not going to switch on validation. What we will do is run, essentially run regular reports because we're still kind of finding our way with this. And we're also, uh, we'll take that opportunity to, to engage with researchers who do deposit impacts so that we can say, yes, you've got that all correct, or you may want to think about this in a different way. Um, the, the responsibilities for, for uh, determining the stuff that will eventually be, be uh, housed in Pure, um, the sign-off on that will primarily be Rebecca, because she knows more about the, the, the nuances of impact than we do. We're, we're, we're really acting as the the conduit for, for how this, this material is going to be coming to us. And we're also obviously going to be going out there to, to um, advocate use of this initially with a couple of schools and then rolling it out wider across the university. And then once we've, we've kind of caught past this, if you like, a pilot stage, then we would be looking to fully embed the service uh, later on in 2023 and then moving forward in, uh, from then on, onwards. So the exciting bit, right? <laughs> I don't know how visible this is to you. Um, so when we looked at the template, we were not just looking at, at field descriptions, but actually the purpose of the fields that were available to us. And so we have added some, we have changed some. I have a, a special request from Moya um, to, to raise specifically the use of mandatory fields. This was not something that was flexible. We couldn't change mandatory fields, um, uh, either removing existing mandatory fields or adding them. So you'll see that the, the um, category of impact, which is the one on the, on the amended template that I've circled in red, um, we have actually got a fake asterisk in there to try and persuade our researchers <laughs> that this is a mandatory field. So it's sneaky. Um, <laughs> they don't tell them, don't let this out of the room, right? But they can go past that without filling it in, but we don't want them to. We want the category of impact to be one of the mandatory fields. So, so um, I've, I've shared it with you, but, but don't tell any of our researchers. Um, 
But we, we made some other changes, and if the sides are accessible, I'm not sure how, how visible they are to you there, but things like rather than having just a, a field that says description of impact, we are trying to direct our researchers in the amount of, and type of information that they put in there. So we've changed that to asking them a, a question about what is the impact that they have achieved and, or, or what do they hope to achieve. And rather than a who is affected, it's a who or what is affected. Because impact isn't always focused on people. It can, infect, it can affect environments, biodiversity. It's sometimes a what, not a who. So we're trying to encourage them to think in a holistic way about this. And then we've added a field also about how their research specifically has contributed to the change that they are, are claiming has occurred. Some of the menus as well, um, we found some of the terminology there um, quite confusing. So what's the difference, for instance, between an impact that's in preparation versus an impact that's open? Um, our categories of impact we have reframed mainly using REF typology, but of course for those of you in, in different research assessment uh, environments would be able to shape this to, to match your own needs. Um, and then we made a choice around rather than having impact level to reflect the degree of maturity, um, we've changed that to geographic markers, but that won't suit everyone. Not everyone will prefer that. This is just a, a summary of the changes that we've made. Um, and this is ongoing work. I do anticipate that we will probably have to revisit these. Um, but in particular, the evidence indicator was a key field for us that we wanted to change, in part to drive those activities. Um, but also to encourage researchers to think quite broadly about the work that they're doing. And our last slide, um, challenges and next steps. Moving all the data. Uh, not that there's an awful lot of data to move, but moving the data to the new template, which is going to be just manual. Um, how do we manage our, our unexpected uh, increase of impacts and, and the workflow that will be at, at, attended to that. That's very much a kind of, we'll see how we go because we don't, we can't anticipate what the, are we going to get a flood of impacts or a trickle? We don't know. So we'll, we'll deal with that as and when, but it is something that we're aware of that there will be an impact on the workload of the team in general. Um, taxonomies was something that again, that Moya wanted us to raise. Uh, the specific one was that um, there's a fixed taxonomy for the document site that you can't change. And they'd like to, we'd like to. Um, advocacy, we'll have to go out there and sell this to them. Um, none of this will actually work without training and documentation. Documentation in particular. Training, we will never get everybody into one lecture theatre at the same time. We will have to do training a lot. Uh, so having documentation to back that up will be really uh, is really required. But person-based support, uh, hold, a lot of hand-holding will have to go on with this. We anticipate that because we had to do this for everything else. So I don't see why impact should be any different. And then finally, interoperability with with other systems. And for us in particular, one that that that, that leaps out at us from a UK perspective is ResearchFish. And I was thrilled to see that Elsevier had. Now, I have to be careful with how I say this. <laughs> Acquired or made an arrangement with Interfolio. Uh, and when this happened, I asked Jan to comment on this about the, the possibility of Interfolio, uh, of ResearchFish now integrating better with, with Pure. And she said, wait till we've signed the actual documents. So I guess you've now signed the documents. So I'll be looking forward to seeing how, what um, interoperability there will be between two members of the Elsevier family. Um, so that's what we, we, we'd be really looking forward to. And of course, there will be other inter interoperability with other systems as and when it's required. And that's our presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>